Welcome to this afternoon's Economic Society of Australia in conversation series where we discuss topical economic issues with leading experts. Let me first begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. I pay my respects to the elders, past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Today, our very special guest speaker is Professor Bill Mitchell. Bill is one of the foremost thinkers on modern monetary theory and holds the chair in economics and is the director of the Centre of Full Employment and Equity at the University of Newcastle. Bill has published widely in refereed academic journals on macroeconomics, labour markets, econometric modelling, and economic development, and has acted as a consultant to the European Commission, the International Labour Organization, and the Asian Development Bank. Now, today's webinar focuses on Bill's policy recommendations and predictions for Australia as we recover from the shock of the pandemic, and explores how modern monetary theory might provide an answer. It is with very great pleasure that I welcome uh, Bill to deliver his comments. Well, thanks very much, uh, Belinda, and thanks for everybody who I can't see uh, for taking the, your lunchtime to participate in this uh, discussion. I'm going to talk a bit about MMT. I've got to put my speed skates on because we don't have much time and we've got 25 years of work. But if you're interested in learning more and you're not sure what it is, then we published a textbook Macmillan published a textbook in 2019, Macroeconomics, there it is, it's still available. Uh, my MMT journey started in, uh, at Melbourne University in 19, late 1970s. And if you think about it, that was a time of uh, 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 emerging high inflation, the second OPEC oil shock had just come, it was just coming through. And the response to the first shock was quite uh, poor from the federal government. And we had, uh, for the first time, the abandonment of full employment. And I, as I'm from, I situate myself on the progressive side of thinking. And uh, I wanted, at the time, the mainstream uh, economics approach was, you know, uh, um, Medigliani and Papademus had published in 75, the Nehru. And, you know, by the, by the time I was uh, uh, starting to get towards my honours year and then into postgraduate, uh, we were getting these ridiculous uh, estimations coming from econometric models that the Nehru was suddenly eight or 9% in Australia. And uh, of course, you know, the policy prescription was you couldn't do anything about that on a macro basis. And I didn't believe any of that. And as a young econometrician, I, I could get any, squeeze any uh, elasticity out of any set of data. And I, so I knew, and, and this, the, the confident in, intervals, the standard errors on those estimates that were being used by people were, you know, the Nehru could be anything from what, 3% to 14% or something. So I knew that it wasn't a very good uh, uh, me measure for policy. And uh, so I sought about developing new ways of thinking that would uh, allow the government to fight the inflation that was a problem without causing the unemployment. And so uh, that's where I started and then um, and at that point I developed a, what I called a buffer stock employment model and, and which we now call a job guarantee which uses a buffer stock method methods to uh, get price stability and, and a, an employment buffer stock of course uh, if you read the if you read my work you'll see that I think that it basically flattens the Phillips curve and uh, uh, gets rid of that trade-off. But then the next major event was Japan and, uh, you know, the largest commercial property collapse in history in 91. And I became very interested in Japan because their unemployment rate hardly ticked up. And I, I started to correspond with people in the Bank of Japan, uh, started to understand that this was a different way of, of running macro policy and uh, 
had essentially became a laboratory for, uh, for substantial number of mainstream propositions like uh, do fiscal deficits drive up interest rates? And the answer is no, of course. Uh, and so I start, and you know, does uh, central bank uh, buying bonds uh, either directly or indirectly in the secondary markets, does that cause inflation? The answer is no. And I wanted to then map, start putting theory together to work out an understanding of why that happened. And then I met in 1995, I met. Uh, Warren Mosler, who was at a, an American banker, Wall Street banker, and he had been developing a lot of the lot of uh, similar ways of thinking, and that's that. So we started working together. It was quite an extraordinary um, partnership. Me being from the Ivory Tower and him being just in the daily grind of uh, Wall Street, and uh, together, and then with others, we started to develop MMT. So what is it? Well, the first thing, first misconception is it's not a set of policies and it's not a policy regime that you can go to or leave. Uh, the way I like to characterize it, it's, it's a lens and it's a way of seeing the current monetary system and its institutions and the capacities of the currency issuing government and the consequences of using those capacities much more clearly. It's that's the lens allows us to see through the fictions that have been created by mainstream economics. And so we reject a number of the main propositions like money multiplier theory, loanable funds theory, which then leads into crowding out types notions. We reject all of that because we examine from the ground up the institutions and the way the institutions actually work, not the way we theorize them to work. And a lot of the insights that I gain from studying and communicating with the Bank of Japan has allowed me to understand very clearly the impact of say fiscal deficits on the, the cash system, the reserve system, the commercial bank reserves, the way in which the, the, that creates challenges for the central bank, the way in which the central bank can manage liquidity and a whole raft of other important things uh, to do with the way the monetary system operates on a daily basis, which then leads you to reject all of those uh, you know, core propositions that are taught in universities by mainstream economists. And uh, uh, so when I say there's no it's not a policy regime, the, the point is that that understanding that we created, that MMT creates, to operationalize that into policy, you need an ideology. So a person with a more progressive ideology who thinks in terms of more of collectives and society, who thinks in terms of more public type solutions, can have exactly the same understanding of the way the monetary system operates, an MMT understanding, as a person who thinks more on the right or the uh, individualistic way, whatever way you want to conceive of that. And though we'll share the same understanding and the same understanding of the consequences of doing things, but have to, to totally different uh, ideologies and therefore different policies. So I'll emphasize, for example, public education, public health, public employment, so, uh, those type public transport solutions like that. And uh, the other person will, will not, not emphasize those things. They'll have different, more private market type solutions. But it's really important to understand. And so many people fall into the trap of saying, oh, those MMT policies. Well, there are virtually no MMT policies there's an understanding. Now, another major event where the modern bit comes from was August 1971, when President Nixon suspended the gold window. And uh, that ended the Bretton Woods system. Well, it didn't end it. It, it. it staggered on for a couple more years until the Jamaica Accords ended it in officially. Uh, in 1975, uh, the, in, in the 
period in between 71 and 75 was the you know, failed attempt through the Smithsonian agreements. But what that, the end of the fixed exchange rate system changed the constraints on government policy. In the fixed exchange rate system, the central bank had to prioritise uh, maintaining exchange rate within the agreement, within the agreed parities. Fiscal policy had to play a, 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 a subjugated role because we had these stop-go type growth scenarios where the, the government would be politically unpopular, try to stimulate the economy, that would drive up imports, and that would cause downward pressure on the exchange rate. And the monetary policy had to then tighten with uh, 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 the foreign exchange interventions plus interest rates to attract capital through the capital account. And fiscal policy had to tighten again. And so in effect, the, the government was always having to manage liquidity very closely. And so any of the liquidity effects of, say, government spending into the cash system had to be offset through taxation and bond issuance. And so we ran, we, the government was constrained in those ways. After the fixed exchange rate collapsed, of course, the central monetary policy was freed from having to uh, uh, defend the currency and fiscal policy was freed also to pursue domestic uh, uh, objectives without being compromised by what the central bank was uh, doing in the foreign exchange market. And as a consequence, the government then eliminated its financial constraints. So a currency issuing government in a fiat currency system, which we entered, countries entered that at different times because you know, Australia took until the mid eighties to float. Whereas you know, America floated immediately in 71. And um, uh, under a fiat currency system, the government has no financial constraints. So all of this talk about how we're going to pay for things and where's the money going to come from that's then politically weaponized to maintain elevated levels of unemployment and not do things in the health system or, or not invest enough in uh, climate transition and all the things that we talk about now. Uh, those questions are, uh, are fictional. They're political. They're not based upon any inherent capacity that the government has in the monetary system. And that's what MMT brings out. It shifts the focus. So go, uh, the federal government in Australia can buy whatever's for sale at any po point in time in Australian dollars. It has no financial limits in what it can do. Now, that's not the same thing as saying it, what, it's not constrained. I'll come to that next. But it has no financial limits. And all of this hoopla we go through about, about the debt and the size of the deficit, they're all just fictions. Is a 2% deficit better than a 4% deficit or worse than a 4% surplus, whatever, of GDP? Well, we can't answer that question because we don't have a context. And the context is what, the, what, what fiscal policy is doing and what the non-government sector is doing with respect to spending and savings. So if you've got a, an external deficit, for example, which Australia's had until very recently for four, four decades or more, you know, averaging about 3% of GDP, and uh, we'll return to that once the terms of trade uh, reverse again, uh, well, if you've got an external deficit draining out uh, uh, net spending from the external sector and the private domestic sector, households and firms want to save overall, well, then you have to run a, a fiscal deficit or, you'll, or you will cause recession. That's the context. And if you try to uh, uh, run fiscal surpluses in that context, you will cause recession. And the only reason for example, a Peter Costello was able to run 10 out of 11 years of surpluses was because of the massive increase in uh, domestic private debt that maintained consumption expenditure and, and offset the fiscal drag coming from the 
from the uh, fiscal policy. And if, if households hadn't have gone from what, 60% of disposable income debt to what, nearly 200%, we were, Australia would have been in recession by about 98 with Costello's policies. And later the terms of trade effects helped him as well. But to say that a 2% deficit is worse than a 4% surplus is just a meaningless statement because we we've need the context. We need to know what the other sectors are doing. And when you think about it, fiscal policy is not the design of fiscal policy isn't to achieve any particular financial ratio. It's to achieve well-being. It's to achieve the things. The government's our agent. And so we want the, our agent to use its currency capacity to do things that advance our well-being, like full employment, like good public health, good, good transport systems. And that's the way we should judge fiscal policy. And so what MMT does is shifts the focus from financial constraints to real resource constraints. And, in, 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 and, and government spending is constrained by the real resources that are available, not by how, where it can get the cash from, because it gets the cash by typing numbers into bank accounts boom, 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 and that's government spending. Doesn't get it from tax revenue. It doesn't get it from issuing debt. The national debt is just our wealth that's past deficits that haven't been taxed away yet. That's all national debt is. And when, the gov when Costello was running those surpluses and, and going on TV and, and, and crowing about how wonderful it was getting the debt monkey off the Australian people's back, what he was effectively do, doing was squeezing the non-government sector, us, and destroying a segment of our wealth, which was held in the form of government bonds. The fiscal squeeze forced us to liquidate. And uh, so MMT provides all of those different understandings of, of the situation. So I know that's inadequate, but that's the time constraint I've got. Uh, uh, I, I know that there's an institutional structure that makes it look as though the government spends tax revenue, but intrinsically it doesn't. It doesn't have to. It spends by just typing numbers in and then has accounting ruses to make it look as though that's where they get the money from. And, you know, the government couldn't, uh, the new prime minister could announce today that before I, the government spends tomorrow, I'm going to do 50 push-ups. And that had become a, we'd say, oh God, he's constrained by how many push-ups he can do. Well, that's, that's what all of those accounting uh, conventions that the Department of Finance and, through, and the central bank, uh, that's what they comprise. They're just uh, uh, screens to cover up the, the intrinsic nature of what's going on. So I could talk more about the theory and whatever, but uh, I know that we've got to talk a bit about the current situation. Now, I'm on the public record as, uh, as saying that I believe this inflationary period is transitory. And what I mean by that is not that it may be short term, transitory doesn't have a temporal element to it, it just means that the normal propagating mechanisms that might make it more persistent are not there. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, what's causing the inflation? Well, of course, the pandemic initially set the, caused it. So you had, for example, uh, huge sectoral imbalances emerging between demand and supply. How? Well, the service sector collapsed because all of us were locked down and too scared to go and get our hair cut. And, the, and in lockdown, we satiated our frustration by going on into the goods market and uh, buying all this stuff online and uh, renovating our houses and doing gardening and buying stuff at Bunnings online or whatever. And so you had this, and meanwhile, the goods market 
was facing major supply constraints because of people, workers getting sick in factories, ships not being able to deliver stuff, uh, truck drivers not being able to deliver stuff and all of those supply disruptions that are still ongoing and um, uh, caused a massive uh, collapse in the supply of goods in terms of timely supply. And so you had the pressure of the, that shift in demand of goods away from services at the same time that you had the supply problems in the goods sector. Now, you, you're always going to get in uh, price pressures uh, arising in those circumstances. And then on top of that, we had OPEC flexing its muscles uh, with some weird profit maximising scheme that they use to suppress supply. There's, there's excess uh, supply capacity in, in OPEC, but they refuse to use it because they are making massive profits. And on top of that, so that's a cartel. It's got nothing to do with the size of deficits or what central banks have been doing. And uh, um, on top of that, then we have uh, uh, Russia invading Ukraine causing huge disruptions. So all of those things, they might be enduring, but they're temporary and they will, they will eventually be terminated. And uh, already, if you, if you look at last night's uh, uh, PMI from uh, the Euroflash POI from the PMI from the Eurozone, you see that for the second consecutive month, cost pressures in the Eurozone have been falling and suggesting maybe that maybe that's peaked already, but I, I'm not as confident as that, but that's what you're seeing in the data last night. I saw that release last night. And what I mean by the absence of propagating mechanisms, mechanisms is that the long-term expectation indexes all around the world aren't really kicking up very much at all. And there's definitely no wages pressure. Now, someone pointed out, I, I saw yesterday, uh, that uh, the German negotiated wage index was slightly, was pushing up. But that, if you go in to examine that more carefully, you'll see that that was just a one-shot, once-off catch-up me measure that the government had promised. That'll go out of the system and you'll get wages pressure back to about 2%, which is no pressure at all. So they're the propagating mechanisms that caused the 70s inflation to go right through to the 91 recession. We don't have them at the moment. And so in, in my view, inflation remains a transitory phenomenon. Doesn't mean it's short term, but it will, it will uh, exhaust very quickly if those propagating mechanisms don't start to play a, in a role in their own right. Now, what does that mean then? That means that the central bank is mad increasing interest rates. And it's, it, it was an act of vandalism, in my view, for the, for the Reserve Bank to increase interest rates and promise more. Because how will increased interest rates get trucks to deliver goods more quickly, get ships running where they should be, get workers not uh, uh, to go back to work who aren't who are, who are, who are not sick anymore get the chinese government to end its lockdowns interest rates are not going to do anything to ease the supply pressures and what all they're going to do is cause further grief to low income workers and uh, those low income families that were induced by reserve bank statements in, 19, in 2020 and 2021 that uh, they were going to wait until wage pressures emerged before they moved on rates and that they, you know, they were holding out that there wouldn't be any rate movements for at least until 2023, probably 2024. And as a consequence, people borrowed uh, beyond their capacities uh, because of the way the banks are uh, uh, push credit onto anyone who moves. And uh, as a consequence, you've now got this situation where the Reserve Bank has basically reneged on that promise or that holding out, and uh, they're punishing the people they induced to buy uh, properties. And uh, 
and all they'll do is cause damage. They won't solve the inflationary problem. And, and if the pandemic eases and the uh, shipping system gets back to closer to where it used to be, then those inflationary pressures will disappear very quickly. And I think, as I said, in Europe, you're seeing those cost pressures uh, are falling quite uh, quickly. And so in that context, the, the major challenges are really not inflation in my view. The major challenges are uh, ha the housing sector. Uh, so we were at least 450,000 houses short as a consequence of years of neglect from state and federal governments on, on, on social housing. And uh, that, that has to be addressed if we wanted to address housing affordability and reduce the inequality. And that means we also have to uh, increase supply, but it also means we have to uh, reduce demand from those that have already got 20 houses. And uh, what I mean by that is that I think we, the government, if it's looking to save some uh, 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 tax foregone, uh, they should have ended negative gearing years ago. And uh, negative gearing doesn't, doesn't reduce rents. Uh, it doesn't do anything other than transfer uh, wealth into the hands of those that have already got sufficient wealth. So there needs to be action on housing. There definitely needs to be uh, uh, action on job creation and job quality. Uh, there definitely needs to be action on restoring some of the integrity of higher education, my sector, and certainly uh, ending this uh, private competitive vocational ed farce that has uh, delivered nothing by way of productivity gains, has lined the pockets of, uh, of capricious private uh, sector educationalists and uh, gutted TAFE as the primary vocational education provider. And the big challenge in the future as, this, as the Australian population ages is productivity. It's not whether we'll, be, we'll run out of money to afford everyone to have hip replacements. We need to, because the dependency ratio is rising, we need to make sure that the new generation of workers is much more productive than the last. And that comes from research and development it comes from education and training. And those things have been really run down and neglected by this obsession of fiscal surpluses, and that has to change. Um, and of course, uh, uh, our health systems have uh, been really stressed and, and all of the cuts and the uh, amalgamations, say in Victoria, uh, the Victoria in the last two years paid for the, the Kennet destruction of the, the health system. And they've got a big catch up job to do and that needs massive investments. And of course, climate change. We're going to need a, a, a massive transformation of uh, our consumption and production habits. We're going to, uh, and the market isn't going to deliver that. The market's doing some of that. Uh, which is fantastic and it's uh, fast tracking renewables, but we still need a lot of government activity there in creating transition frameworks so that we can induce uh, and, and take care of coal communities like up in the Upper Hunter, just up the road from where I am today. And uh, so that those communities don't feel as though we're attacking them, but we're providing them with pathways to maintain prosperity, material prosperity, while contributing to the, the climate effort. Now, if you put all those things together, and I could go on with more, but uh, those things are gonna require substantial government investments and any talk of going back, to, of chasing fiscal surpluses now will completely undermine uh, our, our ability to meet those challenges. So in closing, uh, I've had to really go fast, but in closing, uh, inflation's transitory. It doesn't mean it's not a problem, and it doesn't mean we should be looking, at, uh, looking after low wage workers to make sure that they don't fall too far behind. 
but that shouldn't be the obsession of governments. There, there's there's too much investment to be to be uh, uh, done in the next five years to make sure we become a high productivity, carbon neutral nation with high high uh, high training and uh, uh, um, educational standards, improving our public health system, and uh, setting us up for. Uh, uh, the ageing society future. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Mitchell. Um, so I will now open it up to questions and I will select the most popular ones to start with, um, but do keep upvoting um, questions that you like to uh, have answered. And we do have quite a few to get through. So hopefully we can tease out some of those uh, additional points that you wanted to make, Bill. So firstly, um, regarding, the, uh, we have a question from Todd McHenry uh, on the transition to net zero. So I guess, um, what role should uh, the government play in transforming the economy to a circular economy? Um, uh, just to fill out that question a bit more, um, the government is a vehicle for progressive change. It must play a key role in empowering uh, hard to abate industries um, to begin that transition to a more sustainable way of life. So what are your thoughts on these types of technologies, such as carbon capture and utilisation, being better funded by the state to give these industries a bit of a nudge? And is there a better pathway? Yeah, good. That's, that's, that's the, one of the key questions that are, are facing us all, really, uh, in, in academic life, in research and, research and in uh, public policy. And I go back to the mid 90s where the concept of just transition came about. And a Canadian trade unionist who developed that concept was working in a working on a, a, a dispute in the chemical industry. And it was quite clear that for this particular uh, sector that there'd be massive job losses if the government imposed uh, hard environmentally sensible restrictions on the development of further infrastructure for that sector. And uh, that trade unionist was very enlightened and said that uh, 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 as long as the government avoids the questions of jobs, the workers in those industries are going to side with the bosses in those industries. and. Uh, continue to advocate for uh, investment in those uh, polluted technologies. And uh, so the lesson that, and, and this is a problem that I think the environmental lobby in Australia and elsewhere have had for decades. They, you know, think back to the uh, Adani problems in, before the last federal election, you get uh, urban, urban environmentalists going into regional areas like the Hunter or into up to Gladstone, up into that, that area, and um, all of these areas, forestry areas, coal areas, and just uh, preaching that you've got to shut down, but giving no pathway or hope for those communities. And uh, I've been urging uh, those groups for years to put jobs, jobs, jobs at the forefront of their, their advocacy, because unless you offer people in Singleton, uh, in New South Wales, where the coal is, unless you offer them job pathways to make sure they can keep paying their mortgages, make sure their kids can uh, stay at school and make sure they've got you know decent material lives then you're never going to get the political support and I think that all of us are, uh, unless uh, I'm sick I'm not including the manic fringe here but the vast majority of Australians would would be environmentalists would be green we 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 are seeing the problems of climate change and we want to do something about it and so we're willing to jump up to the plate and, and, and do stuff and support government policy. And I think the you know, most recent federal election has demonstrated that quite clearly. But unless we have a government that's uh, willing to set up transition frameworks with jobs, jobs, jobs at the forefront, 
then we're not going to make much progress and and those areas will um, will bunker down and oppose these policy policies in a in the political way and so you know government has the capacity to invest substantially to make those transitions occur so in i've been advocating for years in the hunter which is going to facing an existential crisis with the uh, uh, with the necessity to eliminate the coal export industry as soon as possible it 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 could become the renewable energy hub of australia and create vertically integrated industry structures where you have research and development manufacturing tech technical assistance sales uh, uh, design and all of those aspects that will go into uh, uh, Australia becoming a renewable energy uh, power, that, that has to have investment. And at the moment, it's not going to come from the private sector. And uh, as, as a consequence, I believe it has to be a, a key role that the, the government plays. And in, in addition, the government has to... Uh, I don't support the using the market to make this transition as fast as we need, because we we've got we've got instances all around the world where carbon emission schemes are corrupted, and I think these uh, you know these carbon offset schemes just really allow the first world polluter to continue while going into places in India and uh, less developed countries and, you know, walking roughshod over local culture and local uh, traditions and creating some infrastructure that uh, they can claim offset. So I don't think that's in our interests as, as a globe to, to do that. I think we need regulative structures and a rules-based transition where the coal industry is given uh, a period, not, not informed by me, but by experts in this area to close down and that's the end of it. And, uh, and, and as that period is unfolding, transition mechanisms for workers and small businesses who've got capital at stake so that they don't get stranded assets and all the rest of it needs to be done. And the market's not gonna do that. And as urban people who want that to happen, in our regional areas, we should all be uh, supporting that. Wonderful, thanks so much for that, Bill. Um, next question, I'm going to actually uh, roll a couple of these questions up into one. Um, they all kind of talk about the politics of MMT. And um, I guess really, do you think there is a good understanding of MMT um, among sort of the politicians? Um, uh, and why do you think it, we have this situation where um, these things that do seem fairly obvious, um, that MMT obviously has some constraints, um, it, it doesn't seem to be getting through in the mainstream sort of thinking. So um, kind of wrapping up those questions, uh, do yeah. you think there's a really good understanding and perhaps why not of MMT in, in yeah. the mainstream sort of thinking? Yeah, I mean, this is a great question. And I did see a, a sort of corollary of that from uh, Feria Sylvia about, uh, about MMT and progressive politics. And that's why I said that uh, it's about ideology policy. MMT is, is essentially politics neutral. Now, you might, you might get the impression because I'm, I'm, I, I'm a progressive I'm on the progressive side of politics as a person and in the in my ideology about you know collective solutions and public solutions and caring for people and the state is responsible in my view for making sure everybody is progressing in life and has opportunities doesn't mean equalizing outcomes but equalizing opportunities you might, and, and because I'm one of the founders of MMT, you might say, oh, well, MMT is progressive. Well, no, it's not. You could be an extreme free market right wing zealot, like I'm a progressive zealot. And uh, you still would have this, and you could still share the understanding of the system with me, but you would just understand that there'd be different consequences. And uh, so MMT isn't, 
isn't anything to do with progressive politics. MMT is, a, is my academic work and the way I apply it to policy questions and policy discussions is because of my ideology. But I know I can point you to MMT people who are on the right who have totally different policy sets to what I have. Now, the more substantive issue that you want to explore is about paradigm shift, I think. And for those who have studied philosophy of science, uh, you will know that paradigms in, uh, in academic disciplines change very slowly. And if you've read the work of Imre Lakatos in the early 70s, you'll know that he talks about degenerative paradigms, which start to lose empirical, uh, empirical veracity. In other words, they stop being useful to explain anything about our world in terms of the data and, and what's happening. Yet they hang on to their superior position in, in the academy and therefore in policymaking circles, et cetera because of the way in which uh, these academies work. And, you know, um, Max Planck, the physicist, had a, is summarised as saying that paradigms shift one funeral at a time. And what he meant by that was that you've got all these senior professors who have built their reputation on, on their work, and then some young buck comes along and uh, demonstrates in their PhD, for example, that their work is fiction. And, uh, uh, and that, that's, that's a major, that's an existential challenge to the, the core senior professors who resist it. And paradigms resist change all the time. And they enter a stage which we call groupthink, where they, they deny reality. And, uh, and eventually the dissonance of the of what's going on relative to the perceived dominant paradigm becomes so great that eventually the paradigm shifts. Now, you know, the classic example is uh, um, um, the idea that we have uh, uh, our brains can heal themselves. So in the early 60s, the, the conventional wisdom was that once you had a brain injury, it wouldn't heal. And uh, all of the clinical practice was predicated on that. And all the senior professors had made their reputations on that basis. And uh, then a young PhD student in, in 1962 came up with the idea that uh, brains do heal themselves more some, somewhat. They stitch together electric circuits and fix themselves up a bit. Now, that, that young student was vilified by the senior professors and driven out of the profession, more or less and diverted into other researchers' projects. And then the dissonance, of course, through the 60s and 70s and the 80s, that people started to look as though their brains were healing after serious car accidents, for example. And then in 1995, and, and, and over that period, some of the senior professors had retired and died. And then in 1995, another, another young student came out, a woman in this case, came out with the same research proving that brains heal themselves to some extent. And the paradigm shifted at that point. The dissonance became so great. And the economics paradigm is not, not uh, is the same. We've got such a vested interest in, in all of the things that I call fictions, that it's going to take time and all the dissonance that's occurring before the paradigm shifts. Now, you know, the fact that Macmillan, the, the largest textbook publisher in the world, gave us a contract to publish our work and is renewing that contract tells you that the paradigm shifting. The fact that we're now in a fiscal dominant era where monetary policy is subjugated tells you that the paradigm shifting. And I'm quite happy for mainstream economists to say they knew it all along. Uh, that's fine by me, they didn't, but I'm quite happy for them to use that as a way of smoothing the path in their careers away from their previous held views to the to more modern views, which are more empirically sustainable. And the last thing I'd say on that is that uh, Australia is very really resistant to changing the policy makers and the academy, but I, I've got great relationships in Japan. And so it's, it's quite clear to me that uh, some sections of the senior policy bureaucracy in the world uh, uh, have made the change already. 
And you can see that in the way the Bank of Japan operates and the way the cabinet operates, very different to the way they, they talk, speak very differently about policy than the way we do. Lovely, thank you so much, Bill. Um, I think I might uh, move on now to productivity um, and we might, depending on um, time, we might wrap it up with this really great productivity question because it is uh, really at the forefront of policymakers' minds, thinking about business dynamism and whatnot. Um, but what um, we like, obviously we know we have to raise productivity. Um, so, what policies would you recommend to make maximise productivity growth? And uh, can you explain perhaps how a job guarantee would be perhaps less inflationary and cause fewer labour supply bottlenecks than the current Nehru approach? Well, they're two separate questions, of course, but. Uh... The productivity one's the really big issue facing, it has been the big issue facing Australia for years. Now, the first point I make about productivity is that the way we construct the idea is extremely biased. And it goes back to the 1930s, more or less, so, you know, the gain for worker concept that emerged as labour force frameworks were being devised. And we had this idea that a, a gain for worker was someone who worked for private enterprise to create profit. And, and anybody who didn't do that wasn't gainfully employed as, we, as the expression in the literature emerged. And so we have this idea that productivity has got something exclusively to do with private sector, um, the private sector and uh, augmenting private sector profits. Now it's got something to do with that for sure. We want, uh, we want all inputs to be, uh, to create the best quality and quantity of output. So we don't want waste. We want to eliminate waste wherever it might be. That's true. But we should also understand that uh, productivity goes much broader than just a worker working for private enterprise. And uh, uh, it's massively, and I think during the pandemic, we saw the benefits of low wage workers, the cleaners and the uh, nurses and the people that really saved our lives in many, in, in many ways. Uh, and so I see productivity as a, as a social concept. And, uh, you know, you think about uh, uh, that and you say, well, What's a problem in Australia? I'll give you an example of why I think like that. What's a problem in Australia? Well, this summer just gone, we've had a lot of uh, deaths from drowning on our beaches. And uh, so who knows, and I'm a surfer, so who knows the beaches and the dangers and the water, system, water very well? The surfers definitely do. And uh, uh, so why not? Uh, and the surfers also, because of their lifestyle, not my lifestyle, but the typical surfer, uh, their lifestyles may predicate them to not being employed on a systematic basis because they like surfing more. Uh, so why not offer them a job, public sector job at a minimum wage, where what would they do? They'd go surfing. But what else would they be required to do? Well, they would be required to take classes for school children, teaching them water safety. Now, would that be productive? Highly productive. It would, it would reduce drownings. It would reduce all the trauma and lost income arising from drownings, the lost output arising from drownings. Highly productive. That's a social concept of productivity. Now, as I said in the main talk, the, the challenge facing Australia in part is the ageing society. We're all getting older and that's, that has changes the dimensions of uh, what policy needs to aspire to. Uh, there's going to be more demands on our health system and less on our kindergartens. And, and the, we've typically constructed the ageing society with all of these... Uh, intergenerational reports that keep coming out with nonsensical uh, projections, we've uh, constructed it as a financial problem. And so, you know, the, the government's sequence of them, not just Liberal, but also Labor in previously, uh, they did produce the 
into the intergenerational report and say, oh, we've got to get surpluses and save up for the future. And saving up for the future meant cutting spending in education, cutting Australian Research Council budgets, cutting uh, vocational education and those things and creating unemployment uh, or, or extending unemployment and uh, uh, to get these surpluses. But, but in doing that, they are really undermining the solution because the solution to the aging society is to expand productivity. And you only get productivity through research, through invention, through innovation, through better work practices, and that require and better training, higher skilled workers, uh, uh, better understandings between workers and bosses, higher real wages to induce people to work more, more productively, not, not through encouraging the gig economy, but encouraging high skilled labor. And all of that requires substantial investment. And that's the one of the huge challenges for this new government, that if they go revert back to, we need to get a surplus and start looking for savings in education and training and research and development and those things, then they'll undermine the future and we'll find out 10 years down the track that, that we've, uh, we've really let ourselves down. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Bill. I think that's a really great um, place in which to end. Um, thank you so much, Bill, for refreshing our understanding of debt and deficits and how they can feature in the recovery from the pandemic. Thank you also to our members for your participation uh, this afternoon and really have a great week ahead. Thanks very much. Thanks for all your help in organising this.